This is Remo Daily, your daily dose of inspiration. Please welcome Dr. Louis Rosenberg. Louis, it's such an honor to host you on Remo Daily. Welcome. Yeah, thanks for having me. When we asked you in the beginning, what kind of music would you like? You said jazz. Why did you say jazz? Yeah, so because we're talking about AI and, and one of the big risks of AI is it re replacing humans. Um, and in my view is that uh, AI will, will have a harder time replacing jazz musicians than uh, than replacing that more more popular styles of music that are that are more uh, formulaic. Um, and so uh, my I, I am I'm definitely a, a proponent of of keeping keeping humans uh, in, in the loop and, and keep keeping human work uh, as uh, as elevated as possible. And so uh, but right now AI is uh, is approaching human level capabilities in a lot of areas. I mean, everybody is talking about it these very days because it feels like it's attaching to our jobs, it's touching our lives, it's there, and it's unstoppable. You have been studying this, not only artificial intelligence, also virtual reality and augmented reality for 30 plus years. And as I said in the introduction, Stanford, NASA, over 300 patents. So first of all, help us understand why you even landed with AI. What, what led you to that field? Sure. So, so my background and my focus really for my whole career has been on the intersection of people and technology, and in particular in using technology to amplify human abilities and, and human capabilities. And so uh, back you know, in 1991, when I started working on virtual reality, uh, it, was, it was really looking at how immersive experiences can expand what it means to be human. And, um, and I was captivated by the potential of technology, and I, I still believe the, t the technology has massive potential, but I, but I actually didn't like being cut off from the real world when you enter a, a virtual world. I actually worried that that you know, makes us less human, and and that's actually what motivated me to um, to really think about you know how can we how can we solve that? And and what I what I really wanted to do back then was take this amazing power of virtual reality, but to splash it all, all over the real world, all over our real surroundings, because so we can have the benefits of computing, but not lose our real human uh, setting. And, and that's what led me to, uh, to to getting funded by the U.S. Air Force to to develop what became the first mixed reality system. Um, and it's really this this thread of how do we how do we keep humans uh, relevant and how do we keep humans uh, powerful and and. Uh, and so that's been my focus, and that's really what led me to AI over a decade ago. Um, and, and really for the last decade, I've been focused on how do we use AI to amplify human abilities, amplify human capabilities, but but not to replace humans, which is so much of the push in, in AI these days, because they do have amazing capabilities for, for automation. Um, but my feeling is that we, you know, we humans are smart, uh, a lot, we're a lot smarter than we give ourselves credit for. And um, and we need to really be pushing hard to, to keep keep humans in the loop and and use AI in ways that that enhance our abilities rather than replace them. That well, sounds great, but you are also concerned. You just uh, joined uh, more than uh, I think thousands of by now artificial intelligence experts in signing an open letter calling for an immediate pause on the creation of so-called giant AIs for at least six months. And of course, this was all over the media because the other people that signed next to you include Elon Musk, uh, Steve Wozniak, engineers from big tech, Amazon, Google, Meta, Microsoft, and even the people working on ChatGPT. So you not only signed it, you also went out there and wrote articles about it. We'll share those in the chat. Why did you sign this? Why did you sign this pause AI letter? Right. So, th so this letter is asking, uh, it is basically asking the industry to to slow down, and uh, and really the, the letter is trying to diffuse what has become an arms race between corporations rushing to get to get new generations of of these large language models, these these foundational AI systems, out to market, and um, 
And so the, the letter is really in, in hope of saying, hey, let's not be pushing each other to, to move faster than we should. Let's make sure these systems are are safe. And and you know, I, again, I've been in technology for a long time. I've never seen a groundswell of technologists push to slow something down this way. Right. Uh, I, I, I'm sure it happened in the past around around uh, nuclear technologies, and and also I think it happened in the biological sciences around genetic uh, genetic engineering. But but this is in, in computing. This is pretty unique. And so why like why now? But like why? And, and I think what people need to realize is that um, you know after decades and decades of work in in AI, the industry, uh, the, the field has has really had a a major uh, a major uh, advancement where these large language models are, they really should be viewed as, as the, a revolution uh, and, and like a computing revolution. It's going to change these, these large language models are going to change society in significant ways, uh, ways that I think are as comparable to the PC revolution and the internet revolution and the mobile phone revolution, which, which all really changed how we, we function. Um, and what like what are the key aspects of this revolution? I think really there's two. One is we will just talk to our computers and they will talk back. And 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 I don't mean the type of talking that we're used to with say Siri or Alexa, where you issue a command and it does something. I mean talking like you're holding conversations with with your computers, and and that will become the way we interact with software. That really changes a lot of how we how we interact with software. And and. And the second thing is that we will, when we talk to our computers, we will ask our computers to create content, create documents, artwork, videos, papers, poetry, music, and the computers will do it. And the computers will do it in in our, many, many cases with professional level human output. And so, mm -hmm. um, so this is this is a big change that is being unleashed in real time. And it's coming at us much faster than these other prior revolutions. So PC revolution, internet revolution, et cetera. Like those happened over periods of years or even decades to transform society. What's what's happening with these large language models is an adoption and a deployment that is so much faster than anything we've seen before. Uh, as it's, it's been reported widely, you know, ChatGPT, for example, reached over 100 million users in just two months. That's just staggeringly fast. Uh, Twitter and Facebook both took between four and five years to reach that milestone. Um, and so the speed is shocking. That means that policymakers are left behind. And it means that we don't have protections in place for the unique dangers that come up as a result of uh, as a result of this rapidly advancing technology. And so the pause is to say, hey, like, we need time for policymakers to catch up, for the for the industry to to uh, to catch up in terms of putting putting safety measures in place. And so, it's it's a uh, I, I think a, a very sensible, reasonable request. Whether or not it happens is a, is a separate issue. And exactly that is what I was going to ask you. So we have a conversation in the chat here in the community already, because John said was what I think are, many people are thinking if we pause. Others around the world will not. And Anne says, which probably also a lot of people are thinking, well, but still we have to try. This is too important um, to, and dire to, to, to get it wrong. Uh, it could be detrimental to humanity. We have to do something. But this leads me back to what you just said. How in the world, like if this pause actually goes through, let's just hypothetically, when would it go into effect and how would it be enforced? Yeah. So, uh, so a few things. One, the you know, this request that really is grassroots coming from you know, uh, uh, you know thousands of people who signed this letter is really it's a request to the industry um, to you know to take a breath. And um, and the thing to understand about these large language models, and again, the pause is not saying stop working on AI. It's saying. Um, we currently have the most advanced large language model out there right now is GPT-4, and it's saying, hey, let's not be training and pushing out systems that are even more advanced than what we where we currently are for the next six months. It, it doesn't mean that there's not vast amounts of okay. work being done in AI. It, there is. It's really just, it's looking at a very specific thing. 
and and the thing about these large language models is it's you know these are not things that people are doing in their garage. <laughs> these are things that require the resources of the largest companies in the world. I mean, it's it's you know OpenAI, which is funded with with billions of dollars, and uh, but also you know Microsoft and uh, Meta, and Google. Like it's that scale of of a company that can even develop these types of models. So uh, so. For it to happen, it would be a, you know an agreement among large these large entities that they'll you know, take a breath and kind of s cool down the arms race. Um, the, the issue, you know, the other point that came up in the chat that you mentioned was that you know, people are worried. Well, if if uh, if one part of the world or uh, put, has a pause, slows down on it, will that put them at a disadvantage? And, and I think I think we need to put this in context, which is which is. These technologies and the potential dangers of these technologies are, these are not technologies that are being designed to be deployed against adversaries. These are technologies where the dangers are to ourselves, right? And so, so any, you know, any society that releases a, a technology like this into the wild with APIs that allow developers to do whatever they want, they're putting themselves at risk, their own people at risk. They're not putting other people at risk and, and other necessarily in other parts of the world. And so in my view is that um, the, 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 you know, the jurisdictions that focus on making their people safe and allow AI to, to be deployed in ways that that are powerful and effective, but focus on safety. They're at an advantage. They're not at a, at a disadvantage. Uh, it's this is not like a you know an arms race of weapons that are pointed elsewhere. <laughs> this is an arms race of corporate built technologies that are going to be interacted with by by us. So I just I just think it requires a different mindset than um, than, than people normally think of when they're thinking of competitive advantage. To, to me, the biggest competitive advantage in AI would be the, the the corporations and the jurisdictions that are able to deploy these really powerful, amazing tools and keep their people safe. So it means the the letter is basically an attempt to say to the people that are developing the next versions of GPT, et cetera, to not publicize for another six months. That is, a, a very, it's a difference to saying, stop your research, stop working on it. It's just an ask to not, to not pu publish another tool. But what is going to happen then in six months? Like, is, then, is that going to be then the next wave of, um, of tools uh, going to be unleashed on us? I mean, is that really, so, are these six months really going to help? So uh, the um, the request is not, is not just to not release these new technologies, but to, to not, to not be training these technologies. And, and by that, I mean, these large language models are pretty different than most other pieces of software, where usually we think of your team of programmers designing something to perform a task. These AI models are trained on massive sets of data to perform a task and or to perform a, a wide range of tasks and um and so there's a you know, the, the idea is hey let's let's stop training these next generation models to, to buy some time now you make good points which is well what's going to happen in six months i were to be in the same issue we absolutely will be in the same issue the same place the, the the hope is that those six months give uh, regulators and policymakers and and the industry itself time to put protections in place, and and so it's really about uh, taking a breath to to allow the world to catch up from the safety perspective. Um, and so let, let me give you an example. Uh, like one of the yes, one of the please. dangers one of the dangers that um, people worry about a lot is that these systems are not uh, extremely accurate. Right. Let, I mean, let me say that again. They're, they are very accurate, but they're not uh, they're not perfect, and uh, and yet they speak with authority. And so, if you ask you know if if you ask one of these uh, large language models to to write a document about something, it will read very very uh, impressively and and authoritatively. But it could have errors in it. It could have subtle errors. It could have just ridiculous errors. Um, 
there are no standards in place. There, there are no regulations in place. There's nothing that um, that really protects the industry or, or even provides a set of standards for the industry about accuracy. Um, it would be really helpful if there were accuracy requirements and standards to um, to protect the public, um, so that that they can trust they can trust these technologies, and so that people don't rush technologies to market that that um, that maybe have have very serious flaws. Another another very common danger and risk people talk about is the ability of of these systems to create content that we cannot distinguish from human created content. Um, and it could be it could be articles, it could be scientific papers, it can be uh, deep fakes um, that look real, but they were generated by computers and they could be deployed at scale to, to spread misinformation, disinformation, uh, to, to manipulate the public. Now, bad actors are already doing this. Are, you know, we already have a problem with misinformation, disinformation, deep fakes, but these technologies allow it to be done so quickly that there's a worry that we, the public, will just be flooded with with content right. that's fake, and we'll and we will lose the ability to tell the difference <laughs> between what's like what's authentic and what's fabricated. And, and now, one solution for that is to require that these large AI systems uh, in, inject watermarks. In, into the content that they produce, and those watermarks would make it uh, identifiable as computer-generated content, and, and ideally would also make it identifiable of, of which AI model generated it. Now, watermarks like this would be really helpful in allowing the public and the world to to know what's real, or at least what's human-generated, and what's computer-generated. Uh, there are no regulations or requirements in place. Uh, the the world needs time to put the tools in place and the regulations in place so that uh, and have regulating bodies that would require that that uh, these systems do that. Now, we don't need 10 years for that to be put in place, but six months mm -hmm. would would help a lot. Um, so in the the third, you know, eighth, another danger people worry about with these large scale AI systems is the impact on jobs, right? Because these systems can create all this content that you know, right now is being created by humans, um, that's you know, predicted to be a particularly big shock to the system. That's a shock, uh, really, to higher paying jobs because it's about creating uh, articles and, and artwork and music. And um, you know, there's no way to stop that from happening. These AI technologies are going to uh, uh, oh, enable that to happen, but uh, allowing the world to prepare for this and um, is is helpful because it's going to be a it's going to be a big shock to the system. I, I do think that these types of um, these types of changes happen you know throughout history and we you know we deal with it. You know, no, but nobody's out there driving horse and buggies today. Like that profession was replaced by other professions, but that didn't happen you know as quickly as as we're seeing. Uh, this technology emerge. And so again, the request is for time. It's not to stop innovation. Yeah, but I but to stick with your metaphor, I really understand that a lot of people that are making horse and are making carriages right now are screaming loud because the first car just drove by. <laughs> and they're hoping for the car to stop so they can, you know, identify why the car is going so fast and why it may already have hurt people, but the car is still there. And it's really hard to imagine that in six months, the car won't be there anymore or that everybody else will have a car or that the car will be much safer. But I completely understand now that you listing all these problems, the impact on the workplace, the confidentially being wrong, uh, the deep fakes, that there, there needs to be um, a certain sort of review phase for this. Um, and there is a, that the call for a pause makes, makes more sense, at least after listening to you uh, right now. And uh, Jolie actually asked, do you see a chance for a global privacy legislation? Because obviously a lot of the personal data that we have shared over the last years through our devices 
is also in some way, shape, or form being scraped by AI. Could there be any legislation like this? Should there be any legislation like this? What, what do you think? So, I, I mean, I definitely think that we need uh, we need privacy protections. Um, these you know these AI technologies can uh, can impact us in all kinds of in all kinds of ways. They can capture um, they, they can capture a lot of information and data about us. Um, and so this this again raises awareness that we you know I, I, at the broadest sense I feel like this the biggest impact of this letter that was put out there is that it, it inspired the conversation that people are having right now and it also inspired it draws attention to the regulators and policymakers to tell them hey we need uh, or, uh, we need them to step up and to really think about all these issues. The impacts of of AI on on privacy is certainly one of them. The impact on jobs, the impact on accuracy, uh, the the, uh, the impact on spreading disinformation, misinformation. And you know, there's one more impact that that I focus on a lot, and I, I speak about a lot, which is in addition to these AI systems being able to generate content. The, the other big change I mentioned is that they will. Um, they're transforming computing to conversational e engagements. And uh, and I worry a lot about the potential of these conversational interfaces to manipulate humans. A and I say that, uh, and to put it in simple terms, if, if I'm a skilled salesperson and I want to convince you to buy something you don't need or believe something that's not true, my best approach is to engage you in a conversation. To engage you in a conversation, to make uh, to make some points, to to watch your reaction to those points, to hear your your counter arguments, to to hear your concerns, and then to come back and address those concerns. And so, you know, a conversation is an interactive form of influence that is extremely persuasive. Um, to date, all of the the influence campaigns that have been happened you know happened online and and are just spreading fixed content, spreading documents and spreading images, we will soon be entering an age where influence campaigns will be conversational, right? You will, uh, you will be engaging, uh, it could happen with a chatbot, but, but again, these chatbots will very soon be, um, have, uh, have faces and will look, look like real people and will sound like real people and you will engage them to, uh, to get information. You will engage them in lots of different contexts through, through computing and these, these conversational AI systems could be used uh, to engage you in a conversation that has an agenda, that has an agenda to, uh, to make points, hear your reactions, and persuade you gradually to believe things or to buy things that you maybe would not normally believe or buy. And as is an entirely was, so new form of influence, and, and regulators are not prepared for that at all. And and the technology is now there to, to deploy this. There was a line I overheard at South by Southwest, the, the innovation festival said that 2024 is going to be the last human election. Um, and I think it was trying to yeah. raise awareness around the fact that elections and campaigns, just as you said, might turn into something that is less and less human and more and more automated. So just to drill down on your example, what could happen is that for the, let's say next election, I am actually conversing with an AI around uh, you know, voting and the AI is not just encouraging me, encouraging me to vote because it has a face, it is maybe coming th to me through video chat. It is also trying to convince me to vote for a certain candidate that I hadn't thought of before and is reacting to my points and is making it really clear that giving my life and circumstances and my arguments, this is the best candidate to vote for. Is that, is that a fair example? Absolutely, and um, and it will and and that you know that's a very plausible example of of how advertisers will deploy or or marketeers or bad actors or, uh, will deploy artificial agents to convince you and uh, and. They will hear your concerns. They will uh, use tactics to to overcome your concerns, and they will be more persuasive than a human 
for, for a couple of reasons. One, these AI systems uh, presumably will be run by big platforms that are collecting data about you over time. And so that data will um, will know things about your interests and your backgrounds and your values and your political views. And so it will come into this conversation prepared to know how, you know, how do I persuade mm -hmm. Felix? And, um, and, right. and it will also keep track over time of, of what worked on you in the past, what tactics. And so these are systems that will adapt their, their persuasive tactics in real time. And it's potentially, um, I mean, I, I view it as potentially the most powerful form of persuasion that we could, that we may have ever deployed because it's interactive. It's adapting to us in real time. And, um, and that's a concern. I mean, that's a, a big concern and regulators are not focusing on it yet. So, um, to, to comment on, on what Rashad just put in the chat, when I was sitting there at South by Southwest, Southwest, listening to the open AI, a co-founder on stage, there was a lady behind me sitting behind me who at several points in the conversation, she just said, holy shit. So you could really see like, you know, listening for her was a moment where she thought I, I wasn't prepared for this. And none of us are like, I'm telling you this because I'm scared as well, but what can we do to be prepared? What do you recommend? You already wrote a book 15 years ago in 2008 called Upgrade about AI designing ourselves out of its existence. So you're clearly someone who has thought about this for much, much longer. And you are an inventor as well. So uh, uh, Brendan just mentioned in the chat, 300, uh, you're a prolific patent holder. So what, what is your advice? What should we invent? What should we do to be prepared? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the most important thing, uh, I, I think, is for, uh, for the public to demand that these technologies are safe and de demand that these technologies are deployed responsibly and not rushed to market. Um, and, uh, and that means um, putting pressure on the industry to say, hey, you know, it's, it's more important that what gets released to the public is, is safe for individuals, safe for society, than it is for that for those products to get to market first or fast, and to put pressure on uh, on on regulators and policymakers to to uh, to hold to, to put requirements in place. Again, like it, it, we, let's let's talk about the example where you're engaged in a, a conversation with uh, with an AI that's maybe maybe it has an agenda to persuade you to vote for a particular candidate. Um, it should be required for you to know that, that that AI has an agenda. It should be required that you know, oh, this is a conversation that's, this is not just a casual conversation, this is an advertisement. <laughs> and, and this is an advertisement that has an agenda. Um, and, and this is what the agenda is, and this is who's paying for it. I mean, these are all things that, um, that the, the policymakers and, the, and all around the world need to be prepared for so that at least we know when we're being when in, when we're engaging with an AI that is uh, intending to influence us. And, and, I mean and, uh, as Anne just very pointedly put in the chat, the AI and TikTok is already persuading me to buy things I don't even need. So it's not like this is coming, it's already there. And we're already under under its influence uh, in a way, but I was cutting you short, Lewis. Sorry. No, yeah, I mean, absolutely. Like, I'll, I mean, uh, uh, there a lot of these dangers already exist in in certain ways, um, and and certainly that the AI algorithms that are used by TikTok and and Facebook and Instagram are uh, arch. They are influencing the information when we get it. They're they're altering our reality for us, and that's a that's a known danger. Uh, what, what's different about these new AI systems is that is that they can adapt in real time. They can, uh, and that's you know, that means that they can bring this type of influence to a very personal level, where uh, it's a you know, it's changing its tactics based specifically on on what you you know how you responded. And um, and, and again, the way I look at it is AI systems like we 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 all know that. 
AI systems can now beat the world's best chess player and the world's best Go player and can can bluff like like very skilled uh, uh, poker players. Like, what chance does an average consumer have if it's engaged in a conversation with an AI that's that's you know is trying to persuade you to buy something you don't need and it has access to to you know your history and your uh, your your interests and your hobbies, and it's reacting to 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 your responses and and working to overcome your your concerns. It's we it's it's not it's an asymmetric uh, exchange of of power. We uh, these AI systems will be very skilled at manipulating us if we allow that that type of technology to get deployed. And even before that gets deployed. Um, Bad actors can use current current generative tools to deploy to just blanket the world with with fake content with misinformation, and we're not prepared to handle that level of uh, of uh, basically disinformation. And again, things like watermarks would would help. Regulation uh, is important, but it's also about the public putting pressure on these large companies mm -hmm. to to realize these dangers are significant. And they have to act responsibly. That they 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 can't just uh, they can't just say you know it's you know yeah they're you know they're looking at it. It's um, yeah. These are happening. So your to... your call to action is basically go to your lo local congressman, your local congresswoman, your local politician, the, the the platforms that you have access to, and demand that as a consumer. And also, if you have the chance, and Julie was already mentioning a, a backlash, if you had a, have a chance to go against it and protest, do it. Uh, I think this is a pretty clear call to action from you. And I want to spend a few minutes on um, your background on Zoom, because you obviously uh, are always trying to use AI in a way that amplifies our, our ways of, of being as humans. And you have developed uh, lately a, a technology called Swarm, hence your Zoom background, which is modeled after biological systems uh, to improve human group decisions and forecasting. And it is a bit different from machine learning because you're actually using real-time info that people are putting into the AI to make informed decisions. Uh, this goes from anticipating uh, famines to, to predicting Oscar results and financial analytics. This has been used all around the world. And uh, before we briefly talk about what it can do, Liz is going to share a brief introduction um, from you online. Everybody can watch this whole video. We're just going to share the first minute here about Swarm from Lewis. The answer goes all the way back to the birds and the bees. And fish and ants, all of these creatures have evolved methods of amplifying their intelligence by thinking, to get, thinking together in systems. This is why birds flock and fish school and bees swarm. They are smarter together than alone. Now, I'm not talking about crowdsourcing like we humans do by taking votes and polls and surveys. I'm talking about forming systems, real-time systems with feedback loops so deeply interconnected that a new intelligence forms, an emergent intelligence with its own personality and intellect. I'm talking about forming a hive mind. Biologists call this swarm intelligence, and it's a natural step in the evolution of most social species. I like to think about it this way. A brain is a system of neurons so deeply connected that an intelligence forms. A swarm is a system of brains so deeply connected that a superintelligence forms. Simply put, a swarm is a brain of brains, and it can be smarter than any individual member. So let me give you an example. Honeybees. There's about 10,000 bees, and they have a very difficult problem to solve. They need to find a new home to move into. That new home could be a hollow log or the hole in the side of a building, or if you're unlucky like I was, a crawl space in your garage. Now, this, this sounds like a simple problem, but this is a life or death decision that could impact the survival of the colony for generations. So to solve this problem, the colony sends out hundreds of scout bees, which search a 30 square mile area and find dozens of candidate sites. 
That's the easy part. The hard part is that they then need to pick the best possible solution from all the options that they've discovered. Now here's the rub. Honeybees have a tiny brain. It's smaller than a grain of sand and has less than a million neurons. You have 85 billion neurons. So however smart you think you are, divide that by 85,000, and that's a honeybee. You probably don't want a honeybee picking a new home for you. And yet honeybees are very discriminating house hunters. They need to find a new home that's large enough to store the honey they need for the winter, that's ventilated well enough to stay cool in the summer, that's insulated well enough to stay warm on cold nights, that's protected from the rain, but also near a good source of clean water. And of course, it needs to be well located near good sources of pollen. This is a complex, multivariable problem. And to optimize survival, the bees need to pick the best possible solution across all of the competing constraints. And remarkably, they do it. Biologists have shown that honeybees pick the best possible solution over 80% of the time. If you were a human CEO and you, and you needed to find the perfect location for a new factory, you'd face a similarly complex problem, and it'd be very difficult to, to pick the optimal solution, and yet honeybees can do it. Let's think about that. A honeybee has a brain so tiny that it can't even conceive of the problem, but when they think together in a system, they can solve it so accurately they can rival a human brain. How do they do this? They do it by forming a swarm intelligence, a brain of brains that combines the knowledge and wisdom and insight and intuition of the group and converges on optimized decisions. I know what you're thinking. Really? Um, John already put it in the chat, a uh, quote from Men in Black. People are dumb, panicky, dangerous animals, and you know it. So, Lewis, um, how can swarm, how can your technology being used in the workplace on a daily basis? Maybe you can just give us one example uh, for how does yeah. this is playing out. Yeah. So, um, so if, if a couple seconds of background, uh, you know, eight years ago when we started working on this, we really focused on how can we how can we harness the intelligence of, of groups, whether it's large populations or, or business teams, basically any size group, and we look to how nature does it, and nature does it by forming swarms. Now, the, the, the comment in the chat is a good one, which is that um, very often uh, we look at human groups as being dumb. Um, and and the, the biological model that, that really represents a, a dumb group is a herd. And so, and so a herd is a, is a situation where uh, you have a single individual can get startled, um, and that individual, like a, a sheep, can get startled, start running in a direction, other individuals start following that herd, and, and more and more, and they, the whole thing, the whole group can jump, jump off a cliff. Um, and so herds are actually uh, not the best way to amplify intelligence. In many cases, they amplify noise, right? Because the noise is that, you know, somebody got spooked, and everybody follows. And and most of our online structures, most of the technology we built is really based on herds. It's based on the first person who upvotes something on on Twitter or Reddit. They influence the next person. And that, so that next person is 30% more likely to upvote. Who influences the next person? And so we've built this infrastructure of the internet that right now is sequential influence. And it creates this herding mentality, which is damaging. Now, Nature uh, found a other method. The other method is called a swarm. A swarm is where everybody is equal, everybody's, uh, and everybody's synchronous, simultaneous. You know, so if you look at a school of fish, there's no nobody's in charge in a school of fish. Uh, they're, uh, a single individual can't run off and, and make everybody follow. Uh, it's a multi-directional tug of war in a school of fish. They make really good decisions. They could navigate the ocean and function as a superorganism for hundreds of millions of years. Uh, swarms of bees do the same thing. Flocks of birds do the same thing. And so we built this technology swarm that allowed groups of humans anywhere in the world to connect and function as this real-time system with push and pull. And, and it works. And, and it, we, we've, seen, uh, we've seen it work for all kinds of different applications. One you mentioned is predicting famines. Uh, the United Nations has used our swarm technology to have groups of experts, about 20 experts. They could be anywhere in the world. They come together in our software called Swarm. And then they predict what's the probability that um, that there's going to be food insecurity in a particular nation in the next 18 months. 
And what we find is that when groups to come together in, you know, as a swarm and make predictions together, we're combining their human knowledge and wisdom and insight and intuition and allowing them to reach decisions that are significantly more accurate than they would have done alone or if they had just taken a vote. And, and we've done uh, we've done studies. We did a study uh, recently with uh, with MIT, looking at groups of financial analysts. And when they come together as a swarm and make predictions as a system, they're about uh, twenty six percent more accurate than if they made those predictions alone or by just taking taking a vote. Uh, we did a, a big study with Stanford Medical School, looking at groups of doctors, very small groups, just five doctors uh, making diagnoses. And they, uh, when they made diagnoses as a swarm intelligence, they reduced their diagnostic errors by 33% compared to if they had just taken a vote or, or made those diagnoses alone. And so uh, really the, the, the bigger issue is that we're, what we're doing is we're using AI as a way to, to connect groups of people together and to allow them to reach optimized combinations of their insights and not replacing uh, human knowledge, not replacing human values, not replacing human sensibilities, but instead amplifying them. And uh, and there's a lot of really positive uses. Got it. And um, he, uh, Sam is asking uh, if you have some some past examples for naturally displayed swarm-like intelligence, not herd-like, of course, um, without it being in the context of a study, is there anything you can share uh, that you have seen that's not in a controlled environment? For for human for human swarms or for just for biological swarms? So humans, yeah, human. Uh, Sam is specifically asking about human groups. Yeah, I, I, so um, one of the issues that, that we humans face is that we we evolved to function in small tribes. Right, we you know we are well equipped to to sit around a campfire or sit around and and um, and make decisions um, with a give and take that's conversational, that is kind of this tug of war that's that's verbal, um, but it only works for 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 small groups and there are small groups that are effective functioning that way, but we now live in a society where. Um, Decisions are being made by very, very large groups, people that are distributed all around the world. Uh, we, we are you know, collecting input potentially from hundreds or thousands of people. And, and the tools that we currently use, the most common tool we use is our polls, right? If we want to understand the, in, in, the insight of a big group, take a poll. It, it turns out polls are polarizing. Right? That's, that's what a poll is. It doesn't, it doesn't help a group agree. What a poll does is it shows the group where they disagree. And what a poll also does is it actually reinforces the disagreements. And so you end up with, with polarized societies. You end up with groups that entrench. Nature doesn't do that. When, when, a, when a large group needs to make a decision as a swarm, it, uh, it highlights where the groups agree rather than where the groups disagree. And so you never see a school of fish you suddenly can't, where they can't agree on which way to go and they break into two different schools and go in different directions. Uh, you never see a school of fish just stagnate. The, the, the biologic, you know, over hundreds of millions of years of evolution, nature found a way for groups to find the solutions that they can best agree upon. And um, and that's, that's, that's not the technology that we are currently, it's not the methods that we as humans are currently using. We, we currently try to understand groups by polling and that all that that does is it reinforces the differences. Uh, so I think we, you know, we've learned a lot from nature and, uh, and the studies that, that we do and, and uh, the, the real businesses that are out there using, using swarms to predict, uh, to make sales forecasts or, or, uh, or business forecasts, you know, they find that they are more accurate um, in capturing the sentiments of their team than they would in, in traditional methods. Louis, I'm so sorry we're at time because I feel like we already only scratched the surface today, but I'm so glad that we heard from you about not only the dangers that are out there and the call to action that we should, you know, um, we should try to make ourselves heard and vouch for things like transparency, like watermarks, like privacy, but that you also are working on solutions where AI is being put in a, in a place 
to help us make decisions together and better. And I hope that we can invite you again, because I feel like six months from now, we're going to look, uh, whether it's being paused or not, an entirely different landscape. And Sam is adding his voice by saying, bring Lewis back. So I'm going to say it to you now, Lewis, uh, uh, we will hopefully be able to bring you back. And if you want, uh, you're always welcome here at Remote Daily. I want to say that our uh, musicians who will never be replaced um, <laughs> have an amazing weekend uh, in Connecticut in front of them. Leonor is actually playing at the Yale Jazz Festival. And this is just one more example for how amazing art is making its waves in the human world. And um, there's a lot of uh, gratefulness for you here in the chat. If anyone has their camera on right now or feels confident to switch their cameras on, we'll do it the remote daily way and give some virtual glitter for Louis Rosenberg, our amazing guest today. Um, this is for you from all around the world, Louis. Um, this is some virtual love. And we always, uh, before we let the final song ring in, Louis, give you the mic for a last message. Is there anything you would like to share with us? Any way we can support you and your announcements? Yeah, I, I uh, mean, my biggest message is for people to be be aware of uh, the potential dangers of AI and uh, and to push push the industry and push uh, governments around the world to to insist on on safe outcomes. Um, it's moving very very quickly, and um, yeah, now is the time for for the world to put these protections in place. Thank you, Lewis. And check out, and this time I'm going to pronounce it right, Unanimous AI, founder unanimous. and CEO, Lewis. Unanimous. I'm still learning, Lewis. <laughs> uh, unanimous founder and CEO, Lewis Rosenberg. We will AI all my misspellings out, of course, uh, after the session. Thank you all. Bye-bye. This is Remote Daily.